Welcome to episode nine of Renewing the Conversation, a series of interviews where we talk to leading industry professionals and experts about renewable energy and heating with a focus on the home and what challenges face the industry and homeowners. Today, welcome Rob Whitney, Senior Sales Development Specialist at Residio. Rob gives us a rundown on smart home controllers for heat pumps, smart meters, flexible tariffs, and the future of green homes. But before we get started, we would like to say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, the Ground Source Heat Pump Association, who are aiming to decarbonize homes and businesses and electrify heating by strengthening the reputation of the UK's ground source energy industry. If you would like to find out more about ground source heat pumps, please head over to their website, www.gshp.org.uk, link below. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button and please show us your support by giving us a thumbs up. Hope you enjoy the interview. Hi Rob, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. We wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, smart tech and energy efficiency within the home. Um, sure. We know that Residio is a distributor for smart solutions within the home. And one of the mm -hmm. first things that we did when we moved into the farmhouse uh, was we, we put in smart TRVs onto our radiators. And I know yeah. that from Mars's perspective, smart tech, you love the geek love side um, of yeah. it. And from, for me personally, I love the way that it gives you a freedom and control to be able to manage your home. So tell yeah. us a little bit about um, the importance of smart tech within the home and the various different things that you can install when you move into a new home. Sure. Um, and thank you for uh, having me on this podcast. It's just really great. There's sort of all different levels really you can do and, and it depends what your outcome uh, you want to achieve really. Um, and it can go very simply from just a, a thermostat that controls the whole home um, to one that controls heating and hot water uh, and then ultimately one that controls different zones or different rooms in, in your home, um, all at different times and temperatures according to uh, the building uh, standards and your own comfort preferences, really. Yeah, I've been involved in uh, smart thermostats, smart controls for, for over 10 years. You might have come across the, the Evo Home product. Um, I was very much involved in bringing that to market in the UK. Um, and I used to train the installers that, that professionally install those products. So smart tech, you said that you can you can do you know, radiator controls. You can do you can have monitors on your uh, walls for thermostats and things. How what are the key components for improving your energy efficiency within the home? What are things that if you really want to look at improving your um, home heating and the en energy efficiency you're getting out of that? Oh. What are the first things that a homeowner should consider upgrading or looking at installing yeah i mean the the biggest thing is avoiding waste uh, and uh, avoiding wasteful overheating of times that you're not using the home say you're away you know um, there's no point having the heating up on maximum comfort level if you're not there to experience it so that's the first step really and, and what kind of all smart thermostats have that ability to either manually set them at a lower level while you're away, or you can configure it so that it just does that automatically um, using your presence location um, from your phone. So, you know, when you leave the home, um, it will automatically go into what's called the geofence mode um, and uh, lower the heating setting. Um, so that's obviously the first thing is to avoid using the heat when you don't need to. The next level down from that would be having different parts of your house controlled at, at different temperatures and different times. So, for example, there's no point heating your bedrooms up to comfort level when you're not going to use them. So, you know, if you're downstairs in the daytime, why, why would you need your, your bedroom heated to, to full level? Um, and you may also have occasional use rooms like offices or, or games rooms, things like that, um, that you could save money on. and all these small amounts add up to, to a big saving. And, and all of these things really are what we go through with the training courses so that installers can carefully apply the heating controls to suit, you know, whatever system that is being applied to. You know, the sky's the limit on this stuff. You can go actually up to 12 heating zones with, with some of the multi-zone control systems. And those could all be, you know, different, different types of uh, rooms. You can also mix different uh, type of uh, emitters so when we say emitters we mean 
radiators or underfloor heating or even electric heat in, in certain areas. You know, you may have electric heat in your in your bathrooms or tarot rails or something like that. And also bringing in control of your hot water. It's a bit of a, a quandary, isn't it, for some homeowners? Yeah. They kind of move into a really nice old period cottage, uh, maybe it's thatched cottage, um, and it hasn't hasn't seen any you know modern tech put into it in, in decades. Um, and they think, where do I begin? And how easy is it going to be to put anything smart into this home? Um, how easy is it? And um, you know, what should homeowners first consider when they're thinking about doing something like this? I mean, retrofit is the key opportunity in in, in all of this stuff. Um, you know, new build is is a separate matter, and you know, ideally, you'd be building homes that don't need any future retrofit. For retrofit, absolutely, this is what this kit was was designed for. It can be as simple as unscrewing the TRV head uh, that's on your radiator valve and swapping out for a, a smart TRV uh, that will then interlink with the other uh, radiators and, and with your smart thermostats. So just tell me if I'm wrong, please correct me because you're the expert here. But when we moved into this property, I was under the impression that when we were first, up, first started to look at smart um, solutions and smart tech yeah. for this home, I was under the impression that basically we had two immediate options to us. We could mm -hmm. either look at bringing in smart controls and hard wiring them and running yeah. the cables kind of through the walls, through the floors, through the ceilings, however, however we chose to do it. Or we could go okay. onto a Wi-Fi system and have mm -hmm. those um, controls wireless. Um, yeah. So, uh, but then there was the additional challenges. Okay, so you're we're now in a farmhouse with a double brick wall through a lot of um, parts of our property, and so now yeah. we've got the challenge of okay, so how do we even get that Wi-Fi signal? you know, consistent across the property. So um, can you talk us uh, through a little bit about the different options with regards to hard wiring and wireless and how do people get around those challenges? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, in in new builds, things tend to be wired because obviously you can run the cables when you're when you're building the uh, building the walls. Um, with retrofit, we're adding in wiring is as disruptive as if you had to change pipe work. That's why you'll find most controls um, the, the designed for retrofit are, are wireless. And they're not Wi-Fi in, in most respects. Some of them are, some of the lower cost ones, but mostly they are a, a, a two-way uh, proprietary uh, wireless protocol um, that has much better range than Wi-Fi. So as, as you'll know with your Wi-Fi, you have to have repeaters dotted around the home to give you that sort of mesh network uh, and, and, and a good enough signal, uh, and particularly in, in old properties with, with big thick stone, stone walls, granite flint walls, all that sort of thing can be can be a real nightmare. With products like uh, Evo Home, they have a, a, a signal strength test facility where the installer can come to your home, set up the base station and have one of the smart uh, TRV heads and actually wander around the property and do a map of how good the communication is to then be able to plan out whether it would be a successful uh, installation. I've done a whole bunch of these over, over the years. Um, I've, I've installed probably 30 Evo home systems as well. It is actually really straightforward to play around with that on site and get a real world signal strength reading. Uh, to give you confidence that it will be reliable and, and robust. Can you just go back um, a couple of steps? Just because when we were looking at this, um, and it was it's so new to me, and and I think for homeowners that have never dealt with this or have or are just thinking about kind of starting to to look at these kind of solutions, um, yeah. I do think that it's something that um, is really important to just kind of touch on again is that the products um, when you see something on a box that says wireless or Wi-Fi. Oh. You know, you kind of, I kind of was under the assumption um, of that kind of, I see the thing wireless and I just presume it was wi it had Wi-Fi. So can you just... That's what everyone um, understands, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, it, it really tripped me up when I first started to look at products and I was saying to Mars, I don't understand. It, it, says, it says wireless. What do you mean? It doesn't have Wi-Fi. So yeah. could you just um, so, tell us the, the yeah. difference between that? What people know as, as Wi-Fi is actually... Uh, a gigahertz frequency. The communication, wireless communication that heating controls and, and other smart tech within the home, and I'm talking about doorbells, um, 
the garage door openers, baby monitors, runs on a much lower frequency. And, and the lower the frequency, the longer transmission distance it, it gets. Mm. And, and, and you'll know this from if your neighbor's having a party, you can hear the bass, can't you? Because mm-hmm. bass is low frequency and, and travels further. The typical sort of heating controls and smart controls, you'll find run on a, on a frequency in the megahertz range. So it's an order of magnitude lower than the gigahertz Wi-Fi. Hence, it transmits a, a lot, lot further. What your Wi-Fi will probably start to stall out within something like 10 meters. With the smart th- controls uh, frequency, it's more like 30 or, or maybe more in, in free air. So as I say, you've, you've got much better uh, signal range. Is it a fair point to say that all of your basic, your, your satellite units are, are then operating on this lower frequency? They're then connecting to like a central hub that would then be connected to Wi-Fi to give the ability to use an app, for example, to change the temperatures on your thermostats, on your underfloor heating? Yeah, that's absolutely correct, Mars. So the other reason why the lower frequency is used is, is actually power consumption. So Wi-Fi is really power hungry. Uh So, yes, the central hub, the central controller is mains powered. And then that has its uh, wireless communication to all the satellite devices and then has Wi-Fi to your broadband. If we could take a couple of steps backwards again, uh, you mentioned geofencing. Geofencing is awesome when people are going to work and they want their um, their, their properties to basically maybe kick down to a a lower temperature. That's probably a little bit more suitable for gas and oil boilers purely because you can get your temperature back up to speed quite quickly. Is geofencing as effective with air source heat pumps or heat pumps in general? Yeah, I mean, the the thing with the geofencing is you can set how it responds and you can set your set your radius say you work i don't know one hour away you could set your radius you know at say 40 minutes kind of distance from your home and then when you go back in in that zone it would it would start to recover the heating the big thing with, with heat pumps is that you want to avoid these massive changes in temperature anyway. If you say if your comfort level on a heat pump system is 20 degrees, your setback temperature, which is you know, the, the lower temperature where you're not you know, actively there or not needing that comfort level, you, you would only really want it a few degrees lower. If you go much lower than that, the heat pump has to work twice as hard yeah. to, to recover that, that temperature. And, and you're in danger of then consuming more energy to accelerate it back up effectively than you've saved by setting it back. If, if your question is, is geofencing suitable for heat pumps? The answer is yes, um, but it's also probably less useful as, as well. We've set up our house to run on multi-zones or on, on various zones. Uh, the one yeah. thing that I've seen quite a lot of that installers are, are recommending is basically just putting a central thermostat somewhere, like let's say in a hallway, uh, and yeah. basically using weather compensation to run that, remove all of the smart TRVs, remove TRVs in general, and just yeah. let the actual house run <laughs> as, as it would just using weather compensation. Which school uh, of thought are you from? Do you agree with that? Or do you think that we should be multi-zoning? It's a difficult one to answer on a general statement. My heat pump, for example, runs on weather compensation. The Mitsubishi master control unit that, that came with it has has a weather sensor actually physically mounted on the heat pump. And then that comes into the, the master controller, um, which you set a, a weather compensation curve on. The zone controls... Uh, and I've still got, you know, either home that I had before. I've just adapted it slightly to, to work with a heat pump with a different control box, a uh, different relay. That is set up so that it doesn't switch the heat pump on and off really quickly. I've been able to carefully apply a weather compensated heat pump with a zoned heating system. The th- main things that you have to consider to avoid some of the concerns that have been expressed in some of these articles and, and videos is to make sure that you don't throttle the heat pump down too much. There's two aspects that heat pumps really hate. Uh, and the, the biggest one is, is restricting its flow. The, the second part is, is having enough heat absorption, if you like, within the home uh, to be able to accept the heat that the heat pump is generating. And obviously, if you've got half of your radiators off, then that might be a problem. When you choose and select the heat pump for your home, you do a full heat loss calculation and you do that room by room 
based on the temperatures that you want to achieve uh, in, in those rooms uh, and also based on the size and output uh, of the radiators that you've got. The heat pump is then specified to be able to, at its maximum output, at the cold outside temperature, minus three typically, to be you know, almost at capacity. If you then apply zoning to that, you're basically reducing that heat demand. You're reducing the amount of kilowatts that the home can absorb. So you have to be really careful how you apply any sort of throttling control to a heat pump. Is there any additional software that can allow uh, homeowners to monitor their energy consumption? Obviously, electricity prices, when talking about heat, pump, heat pumps, yeah. are spiraling. Uh, is there any way that they can actually keep tabs on that and actually, um, I mean, obviously not, I mean, our ASOS heat pump doesn't have any uh, specific app for it. Thankfully, we've got solar PV so we can see the consumption based on that. Are there any apps that you can use to keep tabs on your own uh, personal consumption? Yeah, I mean, I use a bunch of different apps um, to because I'm a, a geek <laughs> and I like to understand all this stuff in depth. Um, so there's the 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 app that come with the heat pump, which tells you how much energy it's uh, it's consumed and how much it's delivered, uh, and you can look at how much it's uh, uh, what the efficiency is on on the different outputs. So with a heat pump, you get the, the higher efficiency at the lower temperature. So there's a, an efficiency for, for when it's in heating and an efficiency for when it's in, in hot water. I don't have smart metering at home, but I do have a, a really great product um, called Loop, which actually is an app-based uh, smart, smart meter. And the little clamp unit goes on the, the power cable in the, in the meter box. Um, and you can see the instantaneous consumption on that and when they fitted the, the heat pump there's monitoring all over it so i'm trying really hard to get access to that data and i've even spoken to the the guy in in base in the government department to get access to it i should have access to it because it's my data if that doesn't happen um, there's a thing called uh, open energy monitor that i'm going to hopefully set up on there where you've got people that are a bit geeky about things like me and into the smart tech they really want to get under the bonnet and understand oh. how all this stuff is set up and if there's any changes they can make to the system configuration to really maximize that efficiency because we've all seen the the price of the fuel going through the roof mm. um mainly fueled by gas uh price ironically so being aware of your consumption is, is really, really important. It's only important if you can do anything about it. Most people have switched tariffs if, if they can. The next step is reducing your consumption. What we do have control of is how much energy we consume. Upgrading to a heat pump, obviously, is, is quite an expensive um, thing to do. Uh, in yeah. addition to that, a lot of people are going to be forced to make additional changes, like maybe upsizing a radiator or radiators. Uh, looking mm -hmm. at insulation, would investing in in smart controls like smart thermostats or smart TRVs save them money in the long term? Is it a, is it a good investment to do? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, it's very hard to make sweeping generalizations about what savings are going to be produced. You'd have to be either brave or stupid to <laughs> to make those uh, make those claims. When I'm asked about what the potential is, I, I always refer to uh, independent tests um, because then it's not me that's saying it uh, it's you know it's evidence that people can take on board or or ignore and uh, again that's something else we've seen quite a lot of recently is um, you, you'll get into a discussion about the energy saving potential of certain ways of operating your heating or or different controls and and then when faced with that evidence the evidence is denied we, we've worked with loads of different uh, test houses and also done field case studies and field trials um, on on heating controls we've been working very really closely with organizations like uh, Beamer, who are a manufacturers group um, for for heating and, and electrical products and working with Salford University and we've proven that even basic changes to your uh, system um, with adding a, a better thermostat uh, can save over 10 percent wow. and that's just change, that's just changing your thermostat when you add on full trv system 
um, and smart control on top of that, the savings can easily exceed 30% on a, on a standard heating system, a standard boiler. And that's that's obviously retrofit. When you're looking at doing it all completely from scratch, with having a perfectly sized boiler, perfectly sized pipes and radiators, you know, good insulation levels, the savings can easily be, you know, 50%. There are a lot of period um, and old homes in the UK. Um, If someone was looking at um, upgrading their home and putting in smart controls, what kind of investment are they going to be looking at financially? And I appreciate that every home is a different size. So, you know, if you're looking at a a one bedroom flat, it's going to be an entirely different cost to, you know, an eight bedroom, you know, really nice big country home. But if you could just give us an example of, you know, something simple, like a a two or three bedroom, um, Mm -hmm. you know, semi, something like that, and and kind of give us just some indication of investment. As with all technology, as as the competition increases and products get mature, you tend to see prices come down. And and that's really been the case with with smart controls as well. A a smart thermostat can can be as as little as... uh, as hundred pounds plus fitting, and and a lot of them are very easy to retrofit. The sort of zone system that kind of we've been talking about today, um, you can get like a starter kit with six radiator thermostat smart TRVs in them um, for around four hundred pounds, um, and that is then can be built on. Uh, you know, you can add more radiators, add, add underfloor heating. Typical full heating and hot water system for a typical sort of semi with the hot water you're looking at something around about seven eight hundred pounds worth of parts plus the fitting and the process of doing the survey that we discussed carefully applying the system will be similar many again if you spend you know sort of four five hundred pounds on on the kit the installer is going to want a day to to do the installation and probably come back a few times to, to tweak it as well. It's a significant investment. I think that's the problem with, with all of this kit is that people look at the cost and, and they're put off. And, and the same with, with heat pumps. You know, you hear stories of, oh, my boiler, oh, I can get a new combi boiler for £1,500, but you're expecting me to spend ten to 1500 quid on a heat pump. Well, what kind of planet are you living on? Well, we're all living on the same planet. That's the problem. And we've been emitting too much carbon dioxide for years. Moving away from fossil fuels to renewable fuels, reducing the amount of CO2 is is the main objective. There has to be a cost associated with, with these carbon emissions. So people have asked me, what is my heat pump costing me to run? I would estimate Based on what I've seen, and I've I only really had it fully commissioned in, in March, okay? So I only had really a few months of it running at the, the colder temperatures. All things considered, I think probably my heat pump will cost me between 150 and £200 a year more than, than it did on gas. Considering that my heating system used to emit between one and a half and two tonnes of CO2 a year, I think that's pretty good value for money. Yeah, and I think happens. we need to we need to change the narrative and stop thinking about these things as being a cost and being an investment. And actually, the government has now worked out the the cost of carbon emissions, and it's a lot more than £100 a tonne. I was really surprised when we were looking at... Um, uh, at what upgrades we could do when we very first moved into this property. And one of the first things that you identified quite uh-huh. quickly was smart TRVs. And yeah. I was really concerned. I mean, as <laughs> as someone who's never delved into this area at all, when Mars came to me and said, oh, I want I want to make all of our radiators smart. I just had visions <laughs> of you know, teams of plumbers coming in, ripping stuff out, um, hardwiring stuff. When eventually we did settle on the smart TR, these that we chose, um, I was a little bit astounded and taken aback when Mars literally went up to the radiator, screwed off mm. the yep. existing control, which was your typical one to five, you know, turn the dial from one to five. And he unscrewed it and put on this little white box and screwed it on and said, well, that's it. 
And I and I just couldn't quite believe it. Mm. So can you just talk to us about that? Because I do think the smart TRVs is one thing that people, all homeowners could do quite quickly. And um, can you just talk about how that in itself can be such a a quick and easy um, thing to change and um, how then what controls you get over those rooms and those radiators? Yeah, I mean, the the smart TRV is nothing, nothing new. Um, they, they've been around over 10 years. Um, they were first developed for apartment blocks in Germany where people had no control over their heating. You know, it was from a, a centralised source, um, district district heating uh, with uh, with a heat interface unit, which looks like a boiler, but, but isn't. For situations where you just literally want to control the output from your radiators without interfacing with, with the boiler or the, or the heating system, you can literally fit the heads in in that very very simple way they can then then connect to an app or to a a master control unit with a a simple uh, sequence of of pairing a a bit like when you pair your phone to your bluetooth speaker and then yeah they will enable you to set the temperature in on that radiator at whatever level you want at, at different times of the day and also if you've got rooms that you don't use all the time say you know a, an arts and crafts room or a cinema room or an office you can set them on a on a lower temperature and then when you want to use that room you can you can bring them up by doing that you can make your your heating smart in every room of the house very easily and, and you can do that yourself so that is usually the first step that people take when they're wanting to improve your improve their heating, some people have have used the term "gateway drug" of, <laughs> of renewable heating. I'm not sure I like that terminology, but um, it, it kind of makes the point that you get people thinking about how they're consuming their energy in their home for for heating, mm. mm-hmm. and it gets you on a path then to think about well, what else can I do? Can I can I then get my smart TRVs communicating with my, with my boiler better? Do I need to make any other changes to it? You know, can I run the boiler on a, a load or weather compensation rather than fixed high temperature? Can I then improve my radiators? So once you get people thinking along these lines, they'll find an interest in their heating that is almost obsessional. So you t- touched on um, with smart TRVs, you've got more control. But with regards to the old um, controls that we used to have, for example, the one to five dial, what makes them not as efficient as a smart TRV? TRVs are are great. You know, the old school ones, uh, they they work well, Um, particularly if if they're of a more modern design with uh, liquid fill inside them rather than wax fill. Basically, the internals of them get warmed up by the air temperature. And, And as that internal wax or fluid heats up it, it, it expands and it pushes down on on the pin in the valve that that re- gradually reduces the, the flow it doesn't switch it on and off quickly it it reacts quite slowly it depends obviously how how much of a heat gain you're getting in in your in your rooms maybe you know there's additional heat coming in through through solar gain from the from the sun but usually they, they work quite well a smart crv works a lot better it takes it to to another level, um, and because it's uh, an electronics device, it's measuring very very accurately what the room temperature is, and then there's a motor inside which adjusts the the stroke. So rather than having this thermal lag where the the wax or the the liquid mm. heats up and expands that element, mm-hmm. the smart CRV is much more accurate so it keeps the keeps the temperature much more stable because really that is the point of a trv is to contain overheating to stop that heat being added into a room that doesn't need it being someone that's in the industry you've obviously got access to a lot of different products so can you just walk us through your home setup at the moment what's worked well and how is it all integrated and working together yeah obviously we've got the evo home uh stuff for the heating uh the hot water cylinder is is now on its own controls used to be controlled by evo home but now is is standalone Uh, and that's a a mixergy hot water cylinder 
and that's a that's a smart cylinder so that comes with an app it doesn't have really a, a user interface on it at all other than a, a bar graph thing that you can kind of override most of the control and setup is done through an app and you see more and more of that recently uh, with with the controls less sort of controllers in the home less boxes on the wall more app controls so the, the heat pump itself that's got its its own smart controls and that's um, it. is that so a mitsubishi heat pump you said it is yes yeah, a mitsubishi kodan um so yeah the heating uh, and hot water is fully fully smart we've got smart security in the home as well um you know your ring doorbell uh, mm-hmm. and the cameras dotted around um that's just about to all be replaced with with a residio system that I'm on Ooh. I'm getting on trial. Uh, lucky recipient of that, so that's going to come nice in soon. Nice perk of the job. <laughs> it is a nice perk of the job. Yeah, um, I have to like write lots of reports to say how it's worked and everything. But um, <laughs> there's a, a water leak detection system as well wow. um, that that detects lit sort of leaks uh, in your utility in, in your kitchen and bathroom you have a little uh, square sort of ice hockey puck thing that you put in uh, and that that connects in with your app and if there's a, a leak detected it, it alerts you uh what else have we got <clears throat> yeah smart av everywhere interlinked alexas we must have like six alexas in the home because <laughs> you end up buying another one and then you just dis- you know, distribute them off all in, in every single room so I can say the wake word. I'm not going to say it again because she'll yeah, no. in the way. Um, play whatever music everywhere. And then literally I'll get uh, you know a wall of sound around the, the whole home, which is really cool. The smart doorbell is in with the Alexa as well. So you've got basically smart doorbell throughout the whole home. That's really cool. We've got Apple TVs. We've got like, two Apple TVs projectors all the rest of it that's all smart as well so as you can tell i'm a real gadget nut um, <laughs> yeah it isn't just toys you know these have real world impacts on your uh on your safety and security you know this winter is going to be the first winter that we're going to see where we've got you know, a lot of people that haven't gone back to the office who are going to be working from home then we've yeah. got um yeah energy prices spiraling and a, a real crisis on our hands mm. with regards mm. to you know looking at um just how people are going to afford their their heating this winter and i think that yeah. it's all going to kind of start going to circle back to energy efficiency and people are going to be having these conversations around the dinner table that they've never maybe had before they've never it's never been top of mind for them um, with regards to thinking about just how they can squeeze every little last Mm. bit out of the energy that they're paying for because they're going to be paying um, higher prices than they've they've paid for in a long long time or if ever so I do think that smart tech is going to be um, probably there's going to be a lot of Christmas presents going around (laughs) this year with with smart TRVs and thermostats it's bad on the one hand because obviously it is going to hit people that that can't afford you know to, to heat their home properly but that's that's not a new thing you know fuel poverty has, has been a problem for, for many years the, the hope up that i have with with all of this is is based on some projects that i've been uh, involved in uh, and and done some site visits to where some really old kind of not really fit for purpose homes have been massively transformed by what's called deep retrofit where you've had these really really sort of damp um, homes that are never comfortable never warm completely transformed with lots of insulation you know they've actually reskinned the complete home wow. you know new new external walls with windows already built into it that literally just get attached on the outside and a new new roof and everything as well and a smart energy system that's that's uh, built in with a pod that attaches the concept sounds too good to be true but it, it really once it's at scale and it's uh, funded properly will, will be transformational people have been putting crazy amounts of money into their their heating to even have a basic level so say just in round terms they've been their bills have been you know 150 pounds a month after this deep retrofit project those bills in terms of its energy use, it's a third of what it was. Wow. And then obviously you've got to then pay for those those updates. What they've been able to do is have the energy bill for the tenant and 
basically use that saving uh, to pay for the upgrades. And you might hear of things called heat as a service business model, whereas instead of the customer paying an uh, energy provider for buying fuel, they buy heat. And by buying heat, that then enables the business model to be created that then reduces the waste puts a really efficient system in and everyone wins thank you very much for your time today rob i think that we've uh, we've really <laughs> it's been really interesting talking to you and i do think that um you know smart tech is going to play a really and smart controls are going to play a really important key part of us moving towards a lower carbon uh, footprint in our homes and also being able to get as much as we possibly can um, out of the high prices and tariffs that we're all going to be faced with this winter Um, and yeah thank you very much for joining us thanks for the insights Rob a pleasure talking to you it's been a pleasure and thank you very much thanks bye-bye